All right, so uh, we just read there in Psalm 35. Um, the sermon I have today uh, is called Without Cause. So you saw there in verse 6 of Psalm 35. It says, Let their way be dark and slippery. Let the angel of the Lord persecute them. For without cause they have hid me for me in their net in a pit, which without cause they have digged for my soul. Let destruction come upon him unawares, and let his net that he hath hid catch himself into that very destruction, let him fall. So the purpose of the sermon today is so you wouldn't be offended when persecution and tribulation do come, um, because as this world waxes worse and worse, um, the hatred of the righteous and of the children of God is only going to increase. Um, and it says that all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, so it's not like you're going to avoid it. Um, you know, we are called to actually suffer for his name's sake. Um, that is what we so signed up for when we, when we became saved. You know, that's one of, the, one of the conditions of being saved, is you're going to suffer for the name of Christ, because as Christ suffered, the servant's not above his master. Amen. And they hate us because they hate Christ. And there's, it's, it's no more simple than that. You know, they hate that we in Christ testify that their deeds are evil, and men love darkness rather than light. Um, and we do testify that their deeds are evil. Um, you know, they hated Christ and they, they crucified him for it. So we, we just need to let it be known that we're going to also suffer as Christ suffered. But one thing we have to make sure of is that when we suffer, it's not because of what we've done, but it's because, you know, of Christ. They hate us because we're walking in righteousness and walking according to Christ because they hate Christ, not because of things we've done. So if you want to turn to Psalm chapter 50, but, you know, the Bible even says, you know, they hated him, you know, they hated him first, so they're going to hate us as well because they hated God. But in Psalm 50 verse 16, it says, But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and casteth my words before thee. When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. So there's a whole list of things here that, that, that can cause you to lose your good name. You know, your reputation with men and with God. Um, people shouldn't have cause to hate you because you're a thief, a murderer, an adulterer, a railer, or a drunkard or somebody who does evil harm to others. You know, but they should hate you for, you know, walking in righteousness and living according to Christ's way. And we, we also don't go out and compromise with the world by committing sin to keep our reputation with the world. You know, we don't go out and drink alcohol to try and win the, win the world, you know, win the drunkards of this world. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, actually lied about taking part in a Nazarite vow to please the Jews. But he was wrong to do that. And James also, he would not sit with the Gentiles for fear of the Jews. But he was also wrong to do that. So you don't get a good reputation by actually being a hypocrite either. You know, the, you're supposed to stand against those things. And so when they partook of those things, even though they knew they were wrong, you know, we, that's not how we keep a good reputation with the world. Like, they're going to hate us because, you know, we're walking in righteousness. But, you know, we don't compromise our standards just as, as, as Brother uh, Callum preached this morning, God doesn't compromise his standards. That's who he is. You know, so even though he can do all things, there are some things he doesn't do or can't do because it's against his nature. And we should also be walking in that same way. There are some things that should be against our nature. So, yeah, we are called to be sanctified and separated from the world. You know, like your family might want you to sit down and watch a movie with them. You don't see them, they're not saved, but you're trying to win them. But if you go and watch a movie with them, then how are you going to then convince them that you're separate from them, you know, and try and, try and win them to Christ? Like, that's, that's what I mean about that hypocrisy. You know, we are called to be separated from the world, and if they hate you because you're separated, so be it. That's what we're called to do. 
You know, we're to please God by doing as he commanded. You know, and the world will hate us anyway. So I'll get you to turn to 1 Corinthians 5. You know, of course, we're all very familiar with this passage. But the Lord won't come to your aid if you're a wicked person and if you're partaking in their wicked deeds, as we saw in uh, Psalm 50 there. You know, if you, and if you actually cause your enemies to hate you through wickedness or through evil speaking... Um, or if, you know, you're, a, you're partaking with thieves, liars, slanderers, adulterers, then, of course, you know, the Lord is not going to protect you from your enemies. In 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1, it says it's reported commonly, there's fornication among you, and such fornication, so as not as much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sanctified, sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And then it goes on to say, you know, I, I uh, wrote unto you in the epistle not to company with fornicators or drunkards or covetous or idolaters or railers, extortioners. You know, it says, for what I wanted to do to judge them that are without, do you not judge them that are within? You know, and it says, therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So doing any of these things is a great way to ruin your testimony. You know, it destroys the church testimony also if we allow them to be in church. And that's why Peter says that judgment must begin at the house of God. You must put away from among yourselves that wicked person. We must begin, we must try to live our lives not according to the evil that others do or the wickedness of the world because then they'll have cause to accuse us. You know, the church is actually supposed to be blameless, you know, spotless to the coming of the Lord. And we can't be that if we have adulterers and fornicators and extortioners in our midst. And that's even, you know, the requirements of a bishop is he also must be blameless and of good behaviour and have a good report of them that are without, that's without the church. And they're just not requirements for a bishop, but they're also good requirements for all Christians. We should all be walking according to those requirements. And the world will hate us if we're set apart in a godly separation. But that's the only reason we should be hated of the world, is for our separation, because we're walking in righteousness. So if you want to turn to First Peter chapter 4, and I'll read to you from, uh, from Psalm 101. In Psalm 101, verse 1, you're going to 1 Peter chapter 4. Psalm 101 says, I will sing of mercy and judgment. Unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. O when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. So even David here is separating himself, saying, I won't know a wicked person. If there's a wicked person who's doing these wicked things, then I'm not even going to have anything to do with that man. That's the way we should be and also the way we should, as a church, be with the wicked of this world. It says, Whoso privily, privily slandereth his neighbour, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will, will not I suffer. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. So again, we're instructed as a church and as individuals to cut off wicked people, you know, to not partake of their deeds. So of course, you know, you try and win them with the gospel, but you don't compromise yourself or, you know, 
um, your sanctification. You don't compromise that in order to win somebody to the Lord. So we're to love the lost and preach in the gospel, but we shouldn't be yoked up with the wicked. And even a brother that walketh disorderly, we should love him and admonish him as a brother, but we should not sit down to eat with him. So you're in there, 1 Peter 4, verse 12. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So again, we see here that you know, we, are going, we are called to partake. He says, don't think it's strange that you're being persecuted. Don't think it's strange or unusual that you're in tribulation because count it, you know, to be counted worthy uh, to be persecuted for the cause of Christ is a wonderful thing. Later on, it says to rejoice in that. But then it goes on to say, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him be ashamed. Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So when we're actually, you know, hated for the right reasons, he said you shouldn't be ashamed, because they hate, they hate a Christ, they're going to hate you too. But if you are any of these things, a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a busybody, and people hate you because you're doing these things, then you should be ashamed because, you know, you're being hated because you're a terrible person, not because of Christ. And there's no glory or rewards in that. So I'll get you to turn to Luke chapter 6, verse 20. So another thing is we shouldn't curse our enemies, and nor should we be, we shouldn't return evil for evil or be yoked up with the wicked. So Luke, Luke 6 will tell us how we should be. I'll just read to you from Matthew 5, 44. Jesus says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And in Luke chapter 6, verse 20, he says, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner did their fathers under the prophets. So again, like there's a whole list of blessings here. But then he goes into blessed are you when you're persecuted. You know, blessed are you when people hate you. I mean, you wouldn't think that's a blessing, but when you're hated for the right reasons, there's great rewards in that. And so we should rejoice in that. You know, so it will come. So th the thing is, just you don't want to bring unnecessary persecution on yourself by being a terrible person, by being wicked, or yoking up with wicked people, ruining your reputation. And even the apostles in the book of Acts said that they, were, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the cause of Christ. Like, none of us are worthy to suffer like he suffered. But to, be, to, to suffer that kind of suffering and know the rewards that we can partake in what he partook of, I mean, it's an amazing thing. There's great rewards in that, and there's a joy in that as well. So in Luke 6, 27, continue on, it says, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, pray for them which desp despitefully use you, and unto him that smiteth thee on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away the cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee. And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. As ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love, them, love those that love them. If you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also even do the same. So again, and, and I'll just go down to the bottom. Luke 6.36 Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. You know, so God's just saying, look, your enemies, yes, they're going to hate you. 
and some of them may even come and smite you. But we need to show the love and mercy of God that he's shown to us. You know, the same love that gives us salvation, the same mercy and grace that gives us eternal life, you know, is the same grace and mercy he's asking us to extend to our enemies. But it doesn't mean that they're going to get away with it because judgment belongs to the Lord. Vengeance belongs to him. So if we do these things, you know, then God is going to act on our behalf, which is why we're instructed not to take matters into our own hands. So if we treat our enemies well and bless them, then uh, we give the Lord the power to deal with our enemies. And you'll actually have a good name and a good reputation amongst the world and amongst God and amongst God's people because they'll see that while you're being persecuted, you're loving your enemies, then God will take care of your enemies. We don't have to worry about that. In Proverbs 25, 21, it says, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. So we get rewards when we treat our enemies well, but also God is going to heap coals of fire upon their heads. So we don't have to worry about the judgment that's coming to them. We just be good to them, show the love of Christ, and the Lord takes care of the rest. And it's restated in Romans chapter 12 as well because it's important. And it's how we're instructed to be dealing with those who hate us without cause. But that's an important phrase, without cause. That's the clarifier here. Is if you're hated for any other reason but there is cause for them to hate you, for any reason other than being of Christ, then there's no reward in that and God's not going to judge your enemies. And we don't return... We, yeah, we don't return on our enemies. We just let the Lord to deal with them. So I'll get you to turn to James chapter 3. But it's important to understand that the words we say, they actually matter. They matter to God and they do matter. In Matthew twelve thirty six, it says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And as we saw in Psalm, in Psalm chapter 50, the sins of the tongue can cause us to be hated of men and its wickedness before God. And the New Testament in James chapter 3, verse 1 says this. It says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. So it is a good thing if you can, you know, if you can offend not in word. It says you're a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. Now, we know this is pretty well impossible for most of us, if not all of us. I know I struggle with this. You know, it's not an easy thing. Um, the Bible even says, you know, that the tongue's an unruly member that cannot be contained, you know. But it does go on to say that even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how greater, greater matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Like, there's not much nice things to say about the tongue. The tongue is an unruly member, and it gets us into a lot of trouble. We, we really need to just be aware of that, and just take note of the words we speak, um, that we're not giving blessing and cursing out of both sides of our mouth. In, Ma in Mark chapter 7, verse 20, Jesus says that that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. You know, so again, it's not those in regards to the food they ate and everything else. Eating the food doesn't make you defiled, but the words you speak can actually defile the body, as it says here in James. It defiles the whole body. In verse 9 of James chapter 3, sorry, no, in uh, Proverbs 24, 28, it says, Be not a witness against thy neighbour without cause, and deceive not with thy lips. So again, it's important for us. Just be honest with our speech. Just let your yea be yea and your nay nay. Um, you know, be honest in your dealings with people. Be honest with your speech. Don't be known as a liar. When James 3 verse 9 says, Therefore bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought, so, ought not so to be. So if we bless men and we bless God out of our lips, then it says the Lord will avenge all the wrongs done to us by our enemies. 
But if we curse men, even our enemies, we give them that cause to hate us. And as I said, that qualifier of, of God's help is without cause. We need to make sure that we're innocent before our enemies and not give them cause to hate us and to persecute us. So Psalm 145, verse 10, I got this off Brother Callum this morning. Psalm 145, verse 10, just says, All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. So again, we're commanded to bless the Lord with our lips. You know, we should always be giving praise and honour and glory to the Lord with our lips. But then we also shouldn't be cursing our enemies and cursing other men either. You know, we should be blessing them and letting God deal with them. In Proverbs uh, chapter 24, verse 17 says, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Lest the Lord see it, and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. So again, if we, if we take matters into our own hands, we, we hate our enemies and give them cause to hate us, then it, take, it can take away the judgment of God. You know, we need to, again, love our enemies and be good to them. Again, it's easier said than done. You know, this is what the Bible commands. It's not an easy thing to do. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And I, I'll tell you, I struggle with this too. I know probably most people would struggle with this. It's hard to love your enemies when they're wrong. But this is what we're commanded to do, to show the love of Christ, to show the mercy that he showed to us. We need to show to others. In 1 Thessalonians 5.15 says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. So again, that's another thing that can destroy our testimony, is when somebody does evil to us and we just retaliate, return evil for evil. It causes us to have a bad reputation. And, I mean, yeah, just no good comes of that. You know, you're, you're causing yourself to be persecuted and hated of the world for no good reason. And there's a contrast between the wicked in Psalm 50, which we did read earlier, and the righteousness that God expects. So verse 14 of Psalm 50 says, Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. So I just love how God just says, you will glorify me. Uh, and that should always be where, where we're at. You know, when he delivers us from that time of trouble, you know, from our enemies, that God is glorified in that. Um, but when you take matters into your own hands, when you return evil for evil, you actually are glorifying yourself. So when you speak evil against your neighbour, you return railing for, for railing, you're glorifying in yourself. But God wants and deserves all the glory. So to do that, we must allow God to fight for us. You know, let him, we show the love of the Father to our enemies and let God deal with the vengeance and judgment. That's his department, not ours. So I'll get you to turn to Psalm chapter 7. But the thing is, if God's fighting for us, our enemies have got no hope. So, I mean, I don't know why you'd want to fight them on your own when God can do a much better job than we ever could. And we'll see that later. I'll read to you from Job chapter 2, verse 3. It says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man? So he's obviously somebody who's bridled his tongue. You know, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him, to destroy him without cause. So what does the scripture say about Job? It says he was the most upright man on the earth in his day, but his friends attacked him without cause. They were blaming him for his condition. But even God himself says that what he went through was without cause. You know, he, he hadn't wronged any man, nor even God himself. Yet he was still persecuted and tri went through tribulation more than any of us have ever gone through. Job knew that his shelter was the Lord, so he was praising his name even in tribulation and defending the Lord against his wicked friends. And he held his integrity in worshipping the Lord even through all of his persecution. So I'll get you to, t you're, you'll be in Psalm verse 7, Psalm chapter 7 verse 1. 
So the Shagion of David, which he sang unto the Lord concerning the words of Cush the Benjamite, says, O my God, O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me, lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces, while there is none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is mine enemy, let the enemy persecute my soul and take it, yea, let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay mine honour in the dust, Selah. So the author is saying to the Lord that if I've made an enemy without cause, then try my heart and judge me as you judge them. Like he wants to make sure, he's, he believes he has a clear conscience before God. He believes he's innocent before his enemies. But he's saying, Lord, I'm not asking you to do something to them that I wouldn't have you do to me, but try me and make sure that I'm innocent in this. Otherwise, judge me as you would have judged them. And in verse 6, it continues, Arise, O Lord, in thine anger. Lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies, and awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. So shall the congregation of the people compass thee about. For their sakes, therefore return thou on high. The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to mine integrity that is in me. O let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. So we should be able to stand before God and have him judge us and try our hearts. You know, if you're, look, if you're seeking for the Lord to, to help you to get revenge or whatever against your enemies, then you need to make sure you're innocent, you know, before your enemies. Otherwise, God is going to try you and judge you, and you're not going to stand up. And so you may end up getting judgment of your own, some heavy chastisement, you know, um, because you've been wicked towards your enemies and returned railing for railing and things like that. You know, if we have things like if we've caused them to hate us through malicious words or deeds, then we're as guilty as they are. We can't go to the Lord and plead innocence. We're as guilty as they are because we've been just as wicked as they have. And God will judge his children probably more severely because we should know better. Um, but we'll look at the next section here, starting in verse 10. Um, we can see how God not only wants to help us, but how his judgment is perfect and is more severe than we could ever inflict upon our enemies. The Lord does say, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. He's our protection and our sword. So we just need to wait upon him and cry to him in prayer for help. But this is important in verse 10. It says, My defense is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Uh, go down to verse 14. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity and hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit and digged it and is fallen into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. So we'll see many, you see many times just reading through the book of Psalms, especially, or even the book of Proverbs, the Lord causes your enemies to fall into their own traps. So they create mischief, but God brings that mischief on their head and not your own. So we'll, you know, I'll get you to turn to the book of Esther, and we're going to see a great example of this. But this is why it's important for us to be innocent before the Lord, because then he will allow all of this to happen. But as God's son or daughter, you know that he loves you and he's, he wants to protect you from those who seek to harm you without cause. And we may not even know some of the times where he's protected us from our enemies because we don't even know that they've been planning or plotting against us. But the Lord, you know, he wants to keep us. He wants us to be separated. And, you know, of course, some, some guys here are great soul winners. You know, he's going to protect you most of all because you're doing the greatest work that there is. But uh, we see here in Esther, you know, it was meant to teach us a lot of things, but the one thing I want everyone to understand is that God can turn captivity captive in your life. So your oppressor will then be humbled before the Lord. So you should be in Esther chapter 5, verse 9. 
Esther chapter 5, verse 9. And we're just going to look at the story here of what happens in the book of Esther, because it's such a great example. It says, Then went Haman forth that day joyful with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself. And when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh his wife. And Haman told them all the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman said, moreover, yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Yet all this availeth me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. So we're about to just have a look at the great sin that Mordecai did to Haman to make him hate him so much. But Haman had pretty much been given, he was an officer of, of the king and he'd been promoted and given basically the keys of the kingdom. He was like second in charge or something like that. He was given great riches, wealth and glory in the kingdom, but none of that mattered because he hated Haman. And so if you want to turn to Esther chapter 3, verse 5, and we'll look at this great sin against Haman. Esther 3 verse 5 says, And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout, throughout the whole kingdom of Azarias, even the people of Mordecai. So he just wasn't satisfied with all the glory, which is everything he was given. Because this one man wouldn't bow down and give him obeisance. But Mordecai didn't do anything wrong. But he was hated, you know. And he, not just Mordecai, but also he wanted to kill all the Jews in the land. And we'll see he even puts out a decree to do such a thing. But you can see that Haman is just a man full of pride. Because that power, nothing, nothing would ever... He was implacable. Nothing could ever, was ever enough for him. He had everything, but because of... You know, because of Mordecai wouldn't bow down and worship him, then uh, just he hated him and all Jews, you know, all of God's people. That was the nation of Israel. So we'll see uh, uh, in Proverbs 8.13, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy in the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. And his pride was about to, about to bring his own destruction. But we can also be assured that the Lord sees the pride of our enemies when they stand against him. Because they're not just standing against us. When we're, when we're walking upright, they're not standing against us. They're standing against God. And that's why God will take his own judgment. So we see, um, if you continue in the story, that Haman actually was blessed of the king, but he sent out a decree to murder all Jews in the provinces of the kingdom on a certain day. Um, and of course, Esther and Mordecai, they petitioned the king to stop this. The Lord does eventually make sure that this is put to an end. But if you want to pick back up in Esther 5 verse 14. It says, Then said Zeresh his wife and all his friends unto him, Let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high. And tomorrow speak thou unto the king, that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. And go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman... And he caused the gallows to be made. So again, you know, he's got this plan, listening to his wife gives this wicked plan, that they're going to build a gallows and hang Mordecai. For what reason? Like what cause has he possibly given to be hanged? Like this, he's done nothing worthy of death. And yet this man just wants to kill him publicly. Turn to Esther chapter 6 verse 1. And I believe this is the Lord also intervening with the sleep of the king. Uh, on that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Tiresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hands on King Azurius. And the king said, What honour and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants administered unto him, There is nothing done for him. And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman was come out the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai in the gallows that he had prepared for him. 
And the king's servant said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So you can just bet that Haman's just chafing at the bit to get in there and tell him, Hey, I need to hang Mordecai. You know, I've got the gallows already. Let's go get him and let's hang him. But that's the thing. You know, this wickedness was turned on him. And that's why I believe God was involved in the king not being out of sleep that night, keeping him awake. So then he hears about what Mordecai has done and then decides to reward Mordecai. You know, as I say, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit goeth before a fall. Like that describes Haman to a T. And the snare that he'd laid for Mordecai was actually becoming his own death sentence. So in, uh, in verse 6, Esther chapter 6, verse 6, it says, So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honour? Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to do? to do honour more than myself. So you can, again, you can see the pride and haughtiness. He's like, oh, king's going to give me great rewards. That's great, you know. And I, and I get to kill Mordecai as well. What a great day. We see what happens. And Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delighteth to honour, let the royal apparel be brought, which the king use, useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head, and let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man withal, whom the king delighteth to honour, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honour. So again, he's like, oh, I get to even name my own rewards. This is great, you know. Um, and again, I'm sure he was quite proud and haughty up until this point. But then the king... In verse 10, And then the king said to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horse, as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of, that, of all that thou hast spoken. Then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honour. So everything good that Haman sought for himself was given to his enemy. And that was the Lord's doing. Haman had prepared a trap to kill Mordecai and honour himself. But the Lord knew the heart of Haman. He also knew the heart of Mordecai and how Mordecai had done nothing worthy of death. How he was without cause before the king, before the people. And that this man just hated him for no good reason. So of course, you know, the Lord, he turned that around. He turned the captivity of Mordecai on his captor. Uh, if you turn to Esther chapter 7, verse 7, it says, And the king, arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went into the palace garden, and Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also the gallows fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. So that's what it looks like when the Lord turns your enemies trap or snare upon their own heads. You know, Mordecai didn't avenge himself, but they cried out to God. And God's the one who actually came through for his people. So we can take that same promise ourselves because we're also the children of God, just, just like Mordecai, just like Esther. So in Esther chapter 8, verse 1, it says, On that day did the king Ahasuerus give the house of Haman the Jews' enemy unto Esther the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther has told what, was, uh, what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring which he had taken from Haman and gave it unto Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. And Esther spake yet again before the king and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. So we remember that that mischief, that was the murder of the Jews on that specific day. Um, but it was ended when Mordecai was able to write a, a letter undoing Haman's recree. 
a decree. In Matthew 23, 12, it says, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. That's a lesson that Haman certainly could have used because he, he did none of those things. He exalted himself, and the Lord just brought him to the lowest of low, to the point where he fell into his own trap. Um, we see Esther 8.15 And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel in blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple and the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. So God's people were spared and the man who was persecuted for no reason was given the honour of the man who sought to have him killed. So we can see that God's judgment is just and I believe we serve a just God. His judgment is always right. And we know that, you know, we know that he loves us. And if we walk up li- uprightly like Mordecai, like Job, like David, like Moses, then God will fight for us like he did for them. He's going to protect us. He'll make our enemies to fall into their own traps. And it's a great and powerful and merciful God we serve. In Psalm 25 two, it says, Oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. So again, coming back to the theme of this sermon, is we need to make sure that we're standing before God without cause, that we haven't given cause to our enemies, we haven't given cause to the world to hate us for any reason other than, you know, being a godly Christian just walking as Christ has commanded us to. So we don't answer evil for, for evil. But imprecatory prayer is, is one way we can. You know, David and, and the Bible shows us that we can pray. If you want to turn to uh, Psalm 140, we just need to let God do his job. Just let him take vengeance and just love your enemies as we're commanded. I'll read to you from 1 Peter 2 verse 21. It says, For even hereunto were ye called before Christ, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. That's guile is like evil speaking. It says, Who when he was reviled, reviled not again, and when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. So the Lord didn't take any vengeance on himself when he walked on this earth. But he gave it up to the Father who judges righteously. And you know that they receive a just judgment. So in, in Psalm 140 verse 1, it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips, sealer. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent man who have purpose to overthrow my goings. The proud have hit a snare for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gins for me, Selah. I said unto the Lord, Thou art my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, Thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Further not his wicked devices, lest they exalt themselves, Selah. As for the head of those that compass me about, let the mischief of their own lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire into deep pits, that they rise not up again. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of thy of the afflicted, and the right of the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. So that's the thing. When we're in, you know, when you're dealing with your enemies, that's why we show love to them. We show the mercy and grace of God to them. But in our private time, we can go to God and say, Lord, these people are trying to hurt me. These people are trying to kill me. And it's up to you to take vengeance on them. And that's why imprecatory prayer is a way that we can Actually, you know, you can get that vengeance on your enemies, but it's not your vengeance, it's God's vengeance. It's praying to God and crying out to Him and giving Him the praise and the glory and just leaving it up to Him, let Him deal with it. 
because we are going to be hated. We are going to be persecuted. And it can even be your own friends and family who persecute you. David was no exception to that, and Christ himself was no exception to that either. Neither are we. But what we can do is make sure that it's without cause. Because then we're innocent before God and our enemies. God will actually reward us and protect us. So we'll finish on 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. So it's 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 1. It says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things that we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. So God can deliver us from wicked men. It says here, from the unreasonable and wicked men. And when he does, he's glorified. But it also says that we must be doing what God's commanded of us. So if you want to know how to live a long life, on how to have that protection and safety of the Lord against those wicked and unreasonable men who seek to harm you, we need to make ourselves useful to God. We need to be good soul winners. We need to be good church members and servants to the people of God. We need to find a, a way to make ourselves profitable to God. Because as it says, God has prepared a work for everyone and we need to, to walk in those works that he's prepared for us. You know, um, Ephesians 2.10, you know, there's the 2.11 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, in, unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has works for us to do. As long as we're doing his works, he'll protect us from those wicked and unreasonable men. So we need to walk in the spirit, do his works and keep his commandments and statutes. We're not to be friends with the world or with wicked men. And as a church, we can keep the church blameless and without spot by doing the work he set out for us, but also to prevent these wicked and unreasonable men from coming and bringing their darkness into the house of God. So we don't give cause to our enemies or God's enemies, but we preach the word of God without compromise and with boldness. So let's pray.